fresh meat. On May 13, 1994, a little film called The Crow was widely released to the general public. Opening on a little shy of 1,600 screens, The Crow shattered expectations, debuting at number one with $11.7 million. It ended up being a runaway hit, and 26 years later, it's been solidified as a modern classic, a gothic tragedy that itself became one. Because of an overworked prop handler mixed with some shitty right-to-work laws, a dummy bullet didn't have its primer removed, which caused the lead round to become jammed into the chamber of the gun. Once a blank was loaded and the chamber not properly checked for blockage, unknowingly resulted in a lethal round that ended the life of Brandon Lee. To honor the late star, and of course, with the blessing of his family, Miramax finished the film using masks and stunt doubles, computer compositing, which was you know revolutionary at the time, shooting scenes from different angles, avoiding the face. They finished what would become a lasting legacy, and in my opinion, a fucking masterpiece. The Crow helped define and bring goth aesthetics into the mainstream. I mean, between merch, a franchise ranging from brilliant to... Are you an angel? Are you another devil? I don't know. Maybe both. The Crow has had quite the road. And though they've been trying for a remake, I mean, casting from Bradley Cooper all the way to Jason Momoa, so far nothing has broke through. And the first still stands as beloved and untouched. But back in the mid-90s, there was hope. There was a passion to take the success of the first and produce a worthy sequel that would not only honor Brandon, but respect and grow the story started by James O'Barr in his original comic. Except no, none of that is what was released on August 30th, 1996, prompting the age-old question, what the f*** happened to this horror movie? With Alex Proyas having no interest and Obar opting out because of his friendship with Brandon Lee. Um, every time I went to go write something for, for the character, um, you know, I was thinking, well, how would Brandon deliver this line? And so I just, I just, I couldn't do it. David Goyer was brought in to write. Now at the time, he was known for some amazing B-movies like Death Warrant, Kickboxer 2, and an early Charles Band classic, Demonic Toys. Now, like Proyas, a new director with a past in music videos was brought in by the name of Tim Pope. Now, famous for doing videos with Queen, Bowie, Iggy Pop, and looks like, uh, everything from The Cure. The world of The Crow was very visually distinct, and to continue that, Pope was hired because of his visual style. Now, Goyer was at the first public screening of the original Crow and overheard some teens say, finally, a movie for us. And he knew that whatever was to be done with the sequel, had to have the same feeling, that same respect. So the mandate for Crow City of Angels was to keep things similar enough that it would fit in the Crow universe, but different to be its own story. Now this is important for everything that happened to City of Angels. The goal was always to be similar, but slightly different. With Goyer and Pope taking the requests of the diehard fans of the original to heart. When I went online with all the fans of the first movie, the thing that everybody said was, well, it can't be Eric Draven, it can't be Eric Draven. As long as it's not Eric Draven, you know, we'll watch a new story. Since Detroit was so iconic in the first film, the goal was to keep that sort of gothic imagery, but organically change it to a new environment where it could stand on its own. New Orleans, yeah, that's how I say it, was tossed around, but, uh, you know, ultimately rejected. And a futuresque Los Angeles was decided as the setting. A city of angels that has been decimated from earthquakes and is full of constant smog and fire. When discussing story ideas for the sequel, Goyer's plan always had the same characters that ended up on screen eventually. The new crow would be Ash, Danny, Judah, and adult Sarah, who actually was poised to maybe be the new crow in a brainstorming session. I mean, Goyer's quoted as saying, If Frank Miller can do it with Electra, why not try it? But alas, uh, this did not go anywhere, and with the film's foundation set, the question was, how to build from this? City of Angels needed to have certain story elements to be a crow film. You know, someone had to die a violent death, and there needed to be a loss of a loved one. And the question is, what could equal or surpass the loss of a significant other? Well, the loss of a child. Now, the goal here was to have a character that dealt more with the idea of being dead and resurrected. You know, what would it be like to be the crow? 
Now before the story was decided to be more of a standalone, as Pope and Goyer didn't want to make the original a required watch to enjoy their film, the idea was tossed around to bring back Top Dollar as kind of a super shredder villain at the end. Now let's be honest, everyone loved Wincott's performance, so much that they seriously thought about bringing him back. This series isn't a stranger to the occult, and they could bring him back from the dead if need be. An early draft had Ash and his brother Danny, you know, no longer his child, work for Judah as sort of, you know, foot soldiers. They would make a fatal mistake which gets them both killed, and Ash would come back because of his sibling love. Now Judah, who had taken Top Dollar's empire after his demise, would still be the villain in this story. But Grange would show up near the end with Top Dollar's eyes in a jar, with a proposition on how to kill the crow. Now in a final fight between Ash and Judah, a resurrected Top Dollar would be an all-powerful anti-crow, who in a cruel twist would take over Judah's body, sending his soul to hell. And yeah, this obviously didn't happen, but let's not pretend this batshit crazy idea isn't interesting considering what we got since. A more traditional goth love story, you know, closer resembling the first, was decided on. And that love story, you know, crucial to the narrative, wouldn't be set in the past like in the original, but would be set in the present. The side story would have the character Ash, our new crow, and a grown Sarah grow close and fall in love over their shared experience. A new crow needed to be cast, and after hundreds of actors, many auditions, and even, and this is true, Bon Jovi being seriously considered, and let's not forget how well he did in Moonlight and Valentino, Vincent Perez was chosen. Pope figured to get a famous American would blind people from embracing the character, and it would come with too much baggage. So instead they went with Perez, who was famous overseas but unknown in the States. Chosen because of his performance in The Queen Margaret, this Swiss French actor would become the new crow. Wanting to differentiate themselves from the rain-drenched Detroit setting, they opted for a gothic, more surreal Los Angeles, which would use smoke and smog as their metaphor for the unconscious. Production designer Alex McDowell and cinematographer uh, Jean-Yves Escoffier, thank you, was brought in to help give this new location life. Now Tim Pope wanted it to be very dreamlike and the smog would be a big part in giving it that feel. Because water is used a lot in night scenes as an element for reflection, and because no rain or water would be used in the sequel, McDowell came up with the idea of using glass. Scouting in East LA, he noticed that no matter where he was, there's always broken glass. And not only would it kick back light, but help the apocalyptic feel of constant earthquakes, which had left the city in shambles, with the blues and grays that became associated with the original. Pope wanted City of Angels to have a warmer glow. Getting mugged once in New York, Pope remembered his mugger being backlit from the sodium vapor streetlights and wanted that look to populate his LA. The devil's in the details. Now to finish the film, a lot of pickup shots, inserts, and others were added, and a cut rumored to be 160 minutes was submitted to Miramax. Enter Harvey Weinstein. Now before it was widely known that he was an absolute monster, he was just known as a complete dick that forcibly re-edited movies he and his brother produced. He would recut others' films without any regard to their original vision. What a dick. <laughs> Enjoy prison, Harv. I would tell you, excuse me for spitting on you, but f you. And The Crow City of Angels was one of these meddling casualties, which resulted in an hour and 25 minute cut, including credits, being released into theaters. So the question is, how different is Tim Pope's cut? For starters, there's a lot of things that are in a different order here. Sarah is still having visions of a man returning and suspects it'll be like another Eric. It's hinted at that this has been happening with increased frequency, and it's sort of weighing on her. Iggy Pop's tattoo freakout happens at the beginning of the film, and actually has nothing to do with the fear of being marked. It's actually more that Sarah messed up and he sees two demons instead of a bird, which actually makes a lot more sense as he would have known it was a crow way before he noticed it in the theatrical version. Again, there's a lot more focus on Sarah, and I mean, being stressed out from her Iggy Pop confrontation, plus the constant visions, she actually shoots at the crow. Ash's realization that he's dead goes a bit further at Sarah's loft. Ash lunges at Sarah, which frightens her and she sticks a kitchen knife in his chest. Realizing he's no longer mortal, pleads with Sarah saying, am I dreaming this? The spider monkey drug production warehouse scene is also extended with Ash shooting himself in the forehead to fuck with Spider, similar to the scene where Eric lets Funboy put a hole in his hand. The peep show jerk scene goes longer 
and after killing Nemo, Ash grabs the girl in the glass box and convinces her to leave, saying, If you value what you've lost, you'll walk away from this place and never look back. Ash returns to Sarah's loft and they converse. He says that he needed to see her again. And so this is where their bond between two broken souls starts to grow. She tells him of her mother dying of drugs, just like Ash's wife, and confides in him about leaving Detroit to get away. And it's here that Ash notices old track marks on her arm, hinting at more of her troubled past. Ash then confides in Sarah that once finished, he may not go back, implying that he wants to stay for her. And what if I don't want to go back? In confronting her regret, Sarah says she wished she had met him before. The fight with Callie is meaner and more aggressive. Ash is pissed the woman he's grown closer with has been taken. A fight ensues and he ends up snapping her arm and tossing her out the window, breaking her back on a car below, which is quickly shown in the theatrical cut. Now what's different here is that then Ash actually teleports down in the shadow of a giant crow, which can be briefly seen in the trailer. Paralyzed, Callie realizes she can no longer move and begs to die. And in a great line, Ash says, My job is to send you to hell. You're in it. There's an extra scene in Judas Tower where he recounts to Sarah his Raymond Moody-esque near-death experience about falling through an ice-covered lake as a child and drowning. He came back with forbidden knowledge of the afterlife and says that he's been on borrowed time ever since. Near the end when the crows are circling Judah's tower, Ash sees Danny in the crowd and is told that it's time to go. Now Ash wants to stay and save Sarah, but Danny tells him that he doesn't understand. He works for the dead and his work is done. And this scene is intense as Ash pleads with his son that he needs to stay and finish. But the cries of the crow grow louder and if Ash stays, he can never go home, left to wander forever. Now the ending fight is similar enough. Sarah is killed and in her dying breath tells Ash Someone had to cross over, and I didn't want it to be you. Now the crows pick Judah apart, and what the script says is from limb to limb. As Sarah's dying, she asks Ash if he loves her. Ash nods, and she gives him Eric's ring, telling him that she'll wait for him forever. It's dark, poetic, and the kind of ending that would have impressed me if rapist Harvey Weinstein had left it in. Ash then heads back to the priest from earlier and is asked why he hasn't moved on. And in a beautiful ending line, the city is filled with shadows. One more won't make it any darker. When it's all said and done, the script alongside the work print fan edit gives us far more of a developed, detailed story, and we see Pope's intentions. But Harvey Weinstein wanted Crow City of Angels to feel like a remake of the first. He didn't trust the audience and trimmed, shuffled, and changed it into the finished product we have today. And Pope doesn't seem to have much of an interest in looking back on City of Angels. He did compliment the fan edit work print that's online, and even made this weird silent movie short of City of Angels on his website. But as far as I can tell, he hasn't shown much interest in returning for a final cut. And who's to say that would truly fix this? I mean, yeah, the man deserves to see the film that he made, get a proper release, but even a better version will still be the weaker of the two. By design, City of Angels was meant to be similar but different. And therein lies the problem. It was never gonna feel wholly original. Let me break it down. Big drug lord runs this city. A young female oracle is said drug lord's right-hand man. Flashbacks with an intense color grade, killing the bird to stop the crow's powers, leaving a cool yet time-consuming mark. Drug lord impalement. But who knows, maybe a true director's cut could set the wrong things right. Hopefully one day we will get to see a stronger version of a sequel that had so much promise yet faded away into the yellow smog of a gothic L.A. I went to a wake on the soaked streets of Blue Island And my father, though a strong man, you know I swear I saw him crying Another generation gone has seen South Poseidon and you put him in the ground You speak a whiskey and it's markin' bound Ain't no new shit going down On the soaked streets of Blue Island